Any door? Dr. Williams, do we have any citizens comment? We did have one citizens comment uh, asking about our mask guidance for next school year. Um, we have been communicating that that will be uh, shared with everyone in mid July. So we just got a little more time to get through the summer, uh, then we'll be sharing all that at one time. So we still have uh, two months before we start back to school, and, and a lot can change in the next two months, which we'll continue to monitor. All right, do I have a, a motion to adopt the agenda? Motion for Roman three and four. All right, we got a motion to adopt the agenda and uh, the consent agenda. Do I have a second? Second. Got a second by Mr. Nornholz. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Motion carries. Uh, first item on <clears throat> items of information by the department, Mr. Niles, uh, giving us an update on our major capital projects. Yes, sir. Thank you. Hope everyone's well this evening. Thank you. We do have an update for you on all of our capital projects. We'll start with our advanced studies uh, center. Uh, this week alone, they've already started grading. You can see if you've been down, landscaping has already started in place. Uh, trees and sod has been put in place. Uh, today, they actually started framing the grand stair staircase. Uh, so that work has started. Um, some of our furniture has already arrived. Uh, McGarrett has uh, had a furniture contract and some of that's already uh, been ordered and has started arriving yesterday. We got to look at some of these pictures we've got uh, going through here. This is the Advanced Study Center from the second level of the vestibule looking down. You can see that the terrazzo at this point has not been polished entirely, so it's going to have them quite listen, but uh, you can just kind of see the look there as you hang down the pendants. This is one of the main hallways of the room. That's on the first floor, the second floor. Second floor. That is the multi purpose STEM lab. That's there with the polished concrete. There is a wall that you can divide that room into two smaller rooms uh, based on what you're trying to accomplish as a, as a classroom. You notice that you have two dry erase boards here on this one wall. There will be a flat interactive panel that will go in this area and then back behind where this picture was taken is another one. So you can set it, have two separate, you know, completely separate classrooms uh, that are there. We've also got just some doors showing some of the office space that's there for the health care science. This is the food of family consumer science lab and some of the, the uh, machines that are in there, the equipment that's in there. The floors are covered because as they're moving all that stuff in and out, of course, they don't want to scrape the new polished floors. Food family consumer science. It's looking great. I mean, if you've driven by that and you've seen in the last couple of weeks, Mr. Niles, it really has changed quite a bit. So, Dr. Williams, with that building, we're expecting to be ready to have classes going in August, right? Yes, yeah. We will do a formal ribbon cutting uh, once we get the CEO uh, from the construction management firm, and we will invite everyone on to it. Probably in shifts. Uh, we, we do plan on also showing it to our employees as we return back to school in the fall. And then as far as our timeline, once that's ready and open, then uh, the, the old CTAE building would come down in some frame. Our hope is it comes down before school starts. Correct. That, that's what we're uh, hopefully shooting for. Did I, did I jump the gun on one of your <laughs> All right. No, sorry, sorry, no, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no, sorry about that. But no, that, that is our plan. And uh, we hope to have our CO in about three weeks for that building. We actually do a punch list this week and next week. Which of the floors is named uh, in memory of Mrs. Roker? First floor. First floor. Okay. And actually, that one wing of the first floor. So we're in the process of working uh, with the family, the board, and some others to put some, put some pieces together and put a couple of snags, but uh, we hope to be able to unveil that at the same time we have to build that. Great. Next one is the uh, media center cafeteria. Uh, masonry work is finishing up. Uh, all of the uh, front entry glass has been placed in, uh, put in place. Uh, we've actually uh, moved the uh, fencing area that was there at the front so that in the next week or so, we'll start moving pavers and 
uh, taking up the uh, current uh, sidewalk area so that we put the new pavers in place and pour all new sidewalk there. Uh, when school starts back, there will not be a fence fence in the front of the building. It shall, it should be already uh, the opening of the building will be there, so it won't need a fence area. The finishing installing skylights, that's all done. Uh, gutter work and downspouts have been put in place. Uh, ceiling grid and drywall sockets have, has actually all been finished. Uh, some of the pictures uh, of the campus, obviously, if you're driven by, you've seen how, how great that building looks. Uh, we'd love to take y'all on the inside before too long, just so you can see how spacious it is. So that's the former entrance and exit to the three-story building. So that is now that hallway and corridor as you come from the existing three-story building. And that's looking back towards the three-story building. I believe right now, Mr. Miles' cafeteria floor is covered. It is. While they're continuing to, to do some of the finishing. There's any serving line. I think some of her other managers are a little jealous of what they're going to do. Oh, Gary, I think they've already started. In the media center. There are, I believe, eight skylights in there. There um, is. That are fairly impressive there. You can see them from the top. And that just shows you the size of the building compared to the three store building on the right. So, just to kind of orient you to where we are. Adrian, looking at that building right, that uh, image right there, uh, <laughs> the media cafeteria in the middle. Um, so what will come down first, uh, the oldest of the CTAD wing in the back? Oh, oh yes, come up two, back. Two, that's two buildings. That's two, is that two separate buildings? Correct, it is. In the back. Well, they're being next. They're really connected. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it doesn't seem like two. There, there's one long hallway as you go over here, and this is the classroom. Yeah, right. The culinary arts building. Yeah, and then, the existing cafeteria will come down last. This will come down once we're able to open the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. yep. Is that going to happen? We hope to open it up during the winter break so that when students and staff comes back in January, we hope to open the building. And hopefully the demolition will be done by then as well. Then the, uh, the new middle school on, for right now on Lake Ever. Uh, the work that's being done uh, again this week, again, all the roads and settlement control, all that's been put in place. Uh, we've obtained a seven day letter uh, from our civil engineer, Trent Drop and Blaston. All of that is complete. Um, we've actually already poured 80% uh, of the building slab, it's already been forged. Um, there's another photo that actually shows some of the steel already being erected. Mr. Niles, this is from Gould, correct? This is, is right, from Gould Drive looking looking at the uh, school site to show some of the site grading work that's going on. We have multiple ponds. Yeah. Oh, it does. Any questions of Mr. Niles? Thank you for right. those great pictures, definitely, for sure. Thank you, Mr. Niles. Uh, next item is the new teacher orientation, Mrs. Collins. Yes, just wanted to um, share the new teacher orientation schedule with you all and ask that you please put lunch at City Park on the Wednesday, July 28th on your calendar. We will be at City Park um, having our picnic again, the little cookout. So 
we ask that you please join us. Any questions? Thank you, Mrs. Collins. One thing, we, one thing we learned during COVID is uh, sometimes when we shift things, we we stay with them. And so we are doing that again, where the schools are taking on quite a bit of the uh, training and all at the school level. Ms. Collins, do you want to mention what we started last summer and then also this summer as far as some of the onboarding? Yes. So um, our, one, our typical onboarding will take place virtually. Um, so we'll do some Zooms. Um, our first one is June 17th with all new hires, and then we'll do um, a couple more in July. So that's what will free them up on July 28th, the 29th, and 30th to just really be in the building. Um, and the only time they're going to be with us in person will be at that big day. So one of the things in the past, imagine that first day of new employee orientation, and you just are taking in all of that information in a group of you know 50 to 60 people. It's kind of hard to process some of it. So this way, by doing the Zooms, uh, we can get that information out in smaller groups, ask questions, provide those so that when they do come in late July, uh, we can hit the ground running. And some of the folks that will be on the Zoom, like Ms. Kethel, Ms. Hobson, um, HR folks, um, <coughs> um, they, will, um, they will, so they will be on the Zoom, so able to answer any questions that they have. I will also um, record those Zooms to send out as we are, um, for any that are not able to make the first one or any of the uh, um, that we'll have to forward. All right, uh, Mrs. Allen, we have the first of uh, two, first reading of two policies. Good evening. I am presenting um, two updates to our um, current policies that we have. Both of these are coming out of um, legislative updates. The first one is the um, <laughs> policy GARH. Um, under employee leaves and absences. Um, this is an addition um, of a new code that talks about paid parental leave um, to eligible employees. Non-certified employees are also are eligible for this, um, for this benefit, um, as long as they are eligible for TRS, eligible um, participation. And this legislative update is an update to House Bill 146. So um, underneath the Family Medical Leave Act, you can see where we've made some updates. And this is the language that was added. This allows them to be paid during it and they're like, they're one of those qualifying days. It will also run concurrently with what we currently have um, under our Family Medical Leave Act, which means that it will not be in addition to, it will run concurrently. Any other questions of Mrs. Allen on uh, policy GA? All right. Okay. Um, next one, Mrs. Allen. All right. Our next item is um, IDE three competitive interscholastic activities um, for grades six through twelve. We are adding some um, additional language, um, and this change is impacting um, the Senate Bill forty two of uh, the Dexter Mosley Act and John F. Michael's formerly the Tentivo Act. Um, but very specifically, this will allow home study students to be able to participate in extracurricular interscholastic activities. Um, there is a, um, a, a timeline in which parents have to submit written notification that their children will be participating in those activities, and they must submit that within the first 30 days of school. Any question of, of Mrs. Allen? We do not anticipate. Um, this policy change impacted us greatly. We have students now, uh, when you look at dual enrollment options and now virtual academy options within the district, um, there are avenues now for our homeschool students who want to participate. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Allen. Uh, members of the Homeschool Association, there, there is a homeschool association in this community. Define members. Um, oh, yeah. Is there a parent and some resource uh, folks? We are aware of many of our homeschool students participating in that co op, essentially. Yeah. Um, but we don't have any involvement with them. All right, next item on the agenda is action item. Dr. Williams, do you want to start out with the uh, school naming of the new middle school? Yeah, as I uh, attempt to multitask and um, pull some documents up while also trying to share, 
Uh, one of the things that I wanted to uh, share with you are a couple of items that have been out there for quite a few months. We've received feedback on them um, and also just uh, what is what is really an exciting time, I believe, overall for Gainesville City Schools uh, as we continue to grow over the last you know, 10, 20 years. Also hoping to set us up anytime you have a middle school that has 1800 students in it, you are you know, running into challenges, uh, whether that's from staff knowing each other, the students knowing each other, just a lot of different things like that. So what I'd like to share with you this evening on the screen uh, are the recommendations, partly from uh, what I shared with you a couple of months ago regarding attendance zones and mascots. So just to kind of recap uh, where we've made um, just an update, we are bringing these tonight as formal recommendations. From an attendance zone standpoint, uh, the group went in uh, and we reviewed a couple of different options related to the attendance zones as far as how that would impact two middle schools and Gainesville City Schools. You can see on the screen there uh, the couple of the options. The one that we went with and we're recommending tonight is what's considered the Morrow Connector. So from Dawsonville Highway, which turns into John Morrow, uh, which then turns into Queen City, uh, that connection and that connector would be the dividing line between uh, one school, one middle school zone and the second middle school zone. The nice part about that connector, it is four lanes all the way through. Uh, so you're not dividing uh, communities, you're not dividing uh, residential areas, you're providing safe turns for buses. Uh, you also are keeping it fairly clean uh, across the, the city. So as you look at the map uh, as a whole, but before I get to the map, this gives you an idea of the students that would be attending that new middle school and also Gainesville Middle School uh, and what the race and ethnicity breakdown would look like. <laughs> you do have a little bit of a difference, about 13% in the Hispanic population between uh, the two schools. Uh, you do have a little bit of disparity also both in your white population as well as a little bit in your, your Asian population. Your uh, African-American population is about 3%. Uh, difference there. So you have two schools that have um, a little more of a balance than what we see across some of our elementary schools. But overall, you're looking at this one school having around 860 students, another school opening with around 830 students, and then there are close to 100 uh, tuition students that may or may not split evenly or where they would go uh, would yet to be determined until we start to share this information. One of the things we wanted to do uh, with this is bring it to you a year in advance. So it allows us to start communicating with families, start working with families, making them aware of which zone they fall in, uh, but also being able to start to build that relationship and build that community of the second middle school. And so that, that uh, informational session, we anticipate starting to share those in the fall to our families. So that is the Morrow Connector. You also see then here the, the map of what that means. As you look at the map of the city, you have this uh, line that goes from Dawsonville Highway to John Morrow Parkway, to Queen City Parkway, and that divides kind of this northern and northeastern section and eastern down to this southern and western uh, part of the city. You do have this more fully intact part of the city. And then as annexations happened, of course, over the last couple of decades, you see more pockets uh, where it's not quite as condensed as you see in some, some more um, traditional areas of the city. And so that is one recommendation is we bring forward the attendance zones to be that connector between um, uh, Dawsonville Highway to John Morrow to Quincy. The second one, uh, and this was, we had about 50 or more people uh, as a part of the committees that discussed all of this. The second one came down to the recommendation of a mascot. Uh, the mascot part of uh, Gainesville City Schools and the Red Elephants has been around for quite some time. One thing that the committee discussed and, and everybody agreed upon really was the fact that if you're going to have one middle school remain as Gainesville Middle School Red Elephants, where you're going to have one middle school as the mascot of the Red Elephants, and the high school is going to remain the Red Elephants, how can you not go with the Red Elephants at the other middle school? And so from a unity and identity standpoint, and in the spirit of being one Gainesville, uh, and while our kids are going to that one high school right now uh, to graduate as a red elephant, they felt that we need to keep it consistent from a mascot standpoint. When you look from an extracurricular consistency standpoint, being able to have one middle school team of, of football, of volleyball, of basketball, of soccer, and so forth, 
so the kids get to know each other across the middle schools. We looked at a few different districts, uh, Valdosta City being one, Colquitt County, and then Habersham County as far as some changes that some of them made over the last few years about the naming of the schools uh, and trying to keep it vertical, but more than anything else, the fact that the mascots and that ownership of, of being one Gainesville and, and having the red elephants as the mascot. So those are the two recommendations uh, that were kind of straightforward uh, as the group is, is concerned. So that brings us to the part about the name of the school. And we started with a list of about 15 or so names uh, that we as a group whittled down to six. And then we sent that back out to our committee and that got narrowed down to four. We brought those four to you uh, back in, I believe it might've been March or so. And what we shared with, with the board was that there were four different names. One was South Gainesville or Gainesville Southern. One was Midland uh, Middle School and one was Queen City Middle School. And I will tell you that part of the process and, and we as a group, I, I don't want to say we were divided as much as uh, we just didn't have one that stood out as like the number one choice. So well, part of the reason we brought that to you as a, as a board, but also to the community was get, to get input on that. So some of the input that we received, and I'll share with you the map. And this is where some of this kind of got a little difficult uh, when you're choosing kind of directional uh, options here. So if you look at the map, you have this southern part that really can also be classified as west. And you have this northern part that really, in some cases, can be classified as east. And, and one of the, some of the feedback that we received was, hey, listen, whatever you do, try not to have a north and a south. Uh, just some of the connotation that goes along with that may not be in the best interest of, of us as a city. Uh, some of the other feedback we received was, look, we need to have Gainesville in the name no matter, no matter what. We want Gainesville to be uh, somewhere in that name. Some of the other feedback we received, and one of the options, to be honest with you, that was the most popular option from a traditional uh, survey standpoint was Midland Middle School. But if you've noticed over the last six months or so, the term Midland, uh, although we tied it more to the historical pieces of what Midland means to the city, there is a kind of a rebranding of a local area here that you see uh, the cursor going around that is really being rebranded as the Midland area. And some of the feedback we received in the committee agreed is that we don't want to lead to confusion. You don't want to lead to confusion of saying you have this Midland area and you have this Midland Middle School, but they're nowhere near each other. So as a group, uh, we, we had breakout groups. We divided everybody uh, back up into the, into the different uh, groups, just had discussions of if we have these other options, do we want to consider other options? And so, board, what I'd like to bring to you tonight are a few other options that, to, to put out there for you based on the feedback we received. And you'll see a little bit of the information there. 32.9% of the respondents chose Midland. 29.5% so chose South Gainesville Middle School. And as we started to look at it, prior to community input, uh, we, we had the two names of Midland Middle School and South Gainesville Middle School. But after community input, there's a lot of discussion about not only coming up with the new name for the new middle school, but possibly also a different name or an extended name for the existing Gainesville Middle School. One, one item that was discussed is up here for a recommendation uh, along with the others is GMS at McKellar. You know, we, we said from the beginning, we don't have any interest in naming it McKellar Middle School because just down the road, you have McKellar Elementary School that's in the county and the confusion between well, McKellar Elementary is in the county, McKellar, uh, middle school is in the city and what that leads to. Uh, so we said, well, what if we consider GMS at McEver and then you uh, named the new one GMS at either New Holland or Jesse Jewell. So that was an option that was thrown out there. And then the other option that was thrown out there was you, you start to see a lot of colleges and universities do this. You see churches do this where you really kind of go back to that core of having the middle school and say you have the GMS West Campus and the GMS East Campus, where the West Campus would be the new school going back to the map. It is truly located right on the west, although the zone may extend beyond just the western portion. The school is located in the west, uh, and then the existing Gainesville Middle School uh, would be renamed or rebranded the GMS East Campus. So our policy, FDC, uh, says I need to bring three to five names uh, to you as a board to consider. And so if you've got any questions for me uh, before any recommendations are made or anything like that, be glad to do that. So our policy says bring three to five, and we kind of brought you five, depending on how you want to look at that New Holland 
or, or Jesse Jewell option. When it came down to it, the committee had a lot of great dialogue uh, regarding the initial options, the prior to the community input, but also everybody was, was comfortable with some of the options regarding McEver and New Holland or Jesse Jewell and West versus East. So just wanted to bring that to you tonight. I know it's been a long process and a lot of people have been involved and we appreciate that involvement. Uh, and at the same time, I know we're ready to, to move on to give it an identity. Oh, can you put the map back on the screen? Uh, probably say, show you uh, two things. One thing that Dr. Williams mentioned that the dividing line is a, is a four lane uh, state highway through the city. Uh, so no neighborhood would be divided. Uh, and then, then, then there is some equal division on some holding housing. Uh, some are east, some are west. So that could be helpful to us. It also shows that the elementary attendance zones, which are the colored, multicolored, will uh, of course, GEA and Monday Mill students will go to a new middle school, but a portion of Centennial and a portion of Fair Street, based on the current elementary zones, would also go. So uh, that's referencing some parity, some uh, uh, mix of, of uh, elementary school bodies going into a new middle school. But the elementary school lines would not change at all. Correct. We changed those a few years ago. A part of it was anticipation of knowing we were likely going to be looking at second middle school. If you go out in Austinville Highway on this western side, this used to be part of GDA. Back when GDA had a thousand students and we had modulars and everything else, we tried to adjust it where we no longer have modulars at the elementary level, which, which we do not. If you also look at Fair Street Zone, you see a lot of blue kind of in the southern side. But this is Chicopee area, and this is the industrial park in the city. So there's there's not a lot of residential. Alan in there. That's, that's Alan Creek. Yeah, yeah, in future. Uh, yes. To future, future industrial. industrial. Yeah. And so, and so you have these two areas here that really would be a bit of a change uh, in a way for the middle school. And so what we want to do is be able to tell next year's sixth and seventh graders and fifth graders, hey, you're going to be our first class at the new <laughs> middle school. Let's go ahead and start. Uh, bringing on the new principal, working with the families, getting to know the community, and I'll make that recommendation uh, after we do this part. But really, it just gives us a, a year to ensure that uh, we answer the questions, to make sure we communicate the direction we're headed, um, and, and using this kind of as our guide uh, as we move forward. Like the GMS Act idea, um, or GMS West and GMS East, to stay in with the one game to it's it's clearly a distinction when you when you look at it. All yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you look at the two schools, here's where. So if you look at this area, you see this is more in the southern part, but the school really is right here in the west. And then uh, middle school is really right here in the east. You really don't want to have the southwest and the northeast. So you got to pick either west and east or more north and south. But based on the feedback uh, we received, west and east is a little less controversial than sometimes what you see with the north and south. I'd like to make a motion to rename the existing middle school um, Gainesville Middle School East Campus and the new middle school to GMS West Campus. Second. All right, we've got a motion and a second. And we're also voting on the attendance of Correct. Yes, if, if you will, uh, include those two others as well. So also the mascot be Red Elephant and the yeah, public we are designating the um, for the middle school. Yes. Middle school. Attendance homes as recommended. That's right. <laughs> All right. So we got a motion by Dr. Rams. We've got a second by Mr. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you for all who worked over the months to make that happen. Uh, next up on the agenda is the recommendation of the New middle school principal at Campbell GMS West. Campbell. GMS West, I think as we've, as we've tossed around all the options, GMS West Campus is, is what's got to start now becoming it's gonna get short. part of our vernacular. GMS West Campus sounds the best, doesn't it, media? 
<laughs> we can go with it. Okay. Um, so let me tell you a little about the process we use for the principal selection. In the past, anytime we have a, a new principal or a principal opening, uh, we've used existing governance councils to be a part of that process. Well, when you have a new school coming on board, we were able to get parents uh, who had expressed an interest, all of them participated in our committee regarding the mascot, the attendance zones, and the name of the school. And so Ms. Collins and uh, I believe uh, one of our principals, Dr. Brown at Monday Mill, uh, were able to join, I believe about five or six of our parents in the interview process for the first round. So they took, we had over 30 applicants as a part of, of the uh, interview process, narrowed that list, I believe down to 10 or 11. Uh, and then that parent group along with Ms. Collins and Dr. Brown recommended uh, three to uh, cabinet and others. So we took the list of 30, got it down to 11, narrowed it down to three, and we brought in uh, one individual and uh, did via Zoom uh, another individual. And what I'd like to share with you is our process that day was, was kind of challenging for the applicant. Uh, they came into this room here at the boardroom and they interviewed with one group that consisted of Ms. Collins, uh, Ms. Lynn Jones, uh, Shay Ray, our federal programs, Renee Boatwright, principal at GBA, as well as five teachers uh, from Gainesville Middle School. And so they had about a 45 minute to an hour interview. And then they went from that interview straight to myself, Mr. Niles, Ms. Peppel, uh, Ms. Griffin, I believe, um, who else was in there? I know Ms. Uh, Ms. Hobson was in there, Mr. Green from the high school and Ms. Freeman from the middle school. So they went from one interview to the next interview. And through that process at the end, we all uh, felt that uh, this one individual, Mr. Louie Mayer, uh, who currently is the principal at um, Harriet Tubman Middle School in Portland, Oregon, uh, is the recommendation as the principal at Gainesville Middle School West Campus. Uh, Mr. Mayer prior to this year uh, spent 20 years uh, in, in Georgia, uh, both as a teacher at elementary and middle school levels, and then also as an administrator at middle school and high school levels, both in Gwinnett County and in DeKalb as well. And so Mr. Mayor, uh, let me share the screen again. Mr. Mayor could not be here with us this evening because his last day of school with his students is not until uh, later this week. Uh, so he will be uh, returning back uh, to the area. He'll be working closely with Gainesville Middle School East Campus and Ms. Freeman and her team to get to know the families, get to know processes, uh, working with them likely three days a week, uh, physically at the school and the other two days a week, working with GEA and Monday Mill, but also here at the board office. Really giving him a year to uh, hit the ground running and we're able to open that school. He'll work with Mr. Miles and his team uh, regarding the um, just the, the final pieces of the new uh, building as it comes on board. So uh, board members, one thing I will tell you that just kind of hit us when we did the interviews, you know, anytime when you do interviews face to face, you learn a lot about somebody and you see some mannerisms and kind of how they interact. It is difficult to do that um, by Zoom. However, uh, there are also um, many times that uh, I did not share the picture that I. How about that, Ms. Hobson? Get her name. All right, good deal. Um, click the wrong button. So um, many, many times when you get in a Zoom, you kind of wonder how stale it's going to be. The one thing that was very quick to recognize about Mr. Mayor was that 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 was no barrier to any of us. We connected with him immediately. The one thing that you will never hear him say are the word students. In his vocabulary, it is all about the scholars. And so all of our students are scholars, which is probably something we'll be adopting sometime very soon. And so just the, the positive, um, positive outlook he brings, but all of his references had one thing in common, that was the relationship piece. We know that in middle school relationships uh, have to be there with our kids, have to be there with our staff, have to be there with our families and everybody involved. And all of the references just continue to support and build up uh, what a great job he does with the, with the relationship piece. So board, I, I would like to recommend uh, Mr. Louis Mayer as the principal of Gainesville Middle School West Texas. Motion to accept. We got a motion by Mr. Smith. We got a second by Dr. Ramsey. Any questions? All those in favor? One, one question I do have. When will Mr. Mayor be here? Is it uh, July 1st? Yeah. July 1st. Motion carries. Uh, next up is first of two items uh, dealing with purchase requests. Uh, Mr. Niles, 
will present a new furniture bid for the media center. Yes, sir. As we uh, again look to uh, get the media center and cafeteria and kitchen open and ready uh, come January 22, we want to come before you and present uh, uh, recommendation to purchase uh, furniture for the media center. Uh, furniture for this center comes from a collaboration of our uh, design team at RLR, architect firm, and Adam Yates with Nice Wonger uh, Audio Visual. They have a arm uh, that actually does nothing but design and install uh, media center furniture. So they did a collaboration and you can see some of the design work that they did. Our high school team liked it. Uh, they gave us several options and this option was chosen. Uh, all, both purchases come from our state bid list. Uh, they have contract numbers on our state list so we're able to purchase directly uh, through them. Uh, it's in the total amount of $285,526.04. Uh, bringing it to you tonight, again, so that we might get ahead of the sum curve. Again, we're hoping to have the entire building ready to go come January. So this uh, gives us that opportunity to get ahead of a lot of school districts and purchasing new furnishings and uh, equipment for a new school year. So we'll have it ready if approved this evening. And board, board members, you can see the layout of the uh, media center of just some of the spaces that are there. You'll be entering from one of these uh, two stairwells into the media center. We do have this area that overlooks the vestibule lobby area. And then you can see the layouts. And if you look at just some of the images, uh, you can see what that space, the number one thing you want to do with any kind of space, especially like this, is be flexible. You want to be able to have furniture that, that you can move fairly easily in case you do need to use it for larger or you want to set it up differently. You'll see areas that have bookshelves on the back of seats and you have uh, other areas that are more like a lounge area for kids to be able to, to work and study and, and do different things. Or you've got kind of stacked areas where students can, can sit and function as a small group. Like this one in particular here in this upper right. This is kind of a workstation where you've got students working and presenting and you've got other students that are able to sit uh, in this half circle as well as also sit back behind it. So it just kind of takes an area and, and condenses it to where this expands the learning space for our kids. Do we have any questions or comments? Motion to adopt the recommendation. We have a motion to approve the purchase by Mr. Smith. Second, Second by Dr. Ramsey. All those in favor? Thank you, Mr. Niles. Mrs. Hobbs, we request to purchase new computer systems for the new engineering lab in the advanced study building. Yes, sir. And we're bringing to you tonight a request to purchase 29 computer systems. Uh, these are 29 Lenovo TV stations and the accompanying monitors. Uh, the technical requirements for these systems are a little beefier because they will be running software that requires uh, that type of, of computer. We are purchasing, uh, again, from state contract pricing. Um, so the total that we're bringing to you for the amount of purchase is $53,144.82. And part of this will be coming from CTAE Perkins funding and part of it will be coming from local CTA. Motion to accept. Got a motion by Mr. Smith, second by Dr. Randy. Any questions, comments? Do we think they're going to be here on time? <laughs> <laughs> not, we not, are told we they're in stock. They're not Chromebooks. Right. So, <laughs> they're in stock. So, be so we, time. as long as we can actually have delivery happen, which is a whole nother thing beyond the, uh, the finding the material, it's getting it delivered. We think it'll be here all the time. Awesome. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you, Mrs. All right. Um, so item number five, the tentative FY22 budget. Dr. Williams. Bring forward a few items for you tonight. Uh, Ms. Pethel here is with us. If you got any questions specifically, she'll be glad to answer those. And before we get to the dates and things like that, I would like to uh, share with you just kind of the overview and presentation 
of what's uh, going to be made available uh, to the public, as well as kind of where we are uh, with our budget. So the uh, budget books, I believe, have been delivered uh, to you or they're available tonight if you need to pick those up. So let's look a little bit about the revenues. Uh, this is a, a little more of a delay than what we anticipated, uh, mainly because uh, we were awaiting some of these more specific information regarding the digest, because we didn't want to put a number out there that was uh, going to be changed uh, later on. So we feel pretty confident with the information that we've received. But one thing when you look at the uh, FY22 budget, uh, we are comparing it to the FY21 amended budget. The big number you want to look at more than anything else is this bottom right. And it's kind of hard to look at this bottom number and be like, how are we losing more revenue? So let's, let's keep in mind a couple of things. The local ta tax base is actually at a slight decrease, and we'll share why that is in just a moment regarding the millage rate. But the other side is the QBE, so Quality Basic Education Act that was passed in the mid 80s is how we receive our funding as a school system. And you can see that we are getting 1.258 million less than what we received in the amended budget. The number one reason for that is we lost about 200, we had lose kids. So let me be careful not to say we lost kids. 250 fewer students attended Gainesville City Schools this year than last year. Uh, as far as the count day is concerned, as far as our reporting is concerned. So our loss that you see right there is uh, predominantly due to uh, fewer students, uh, mainly at the elementary level. Uh, we saw students maybe, and you know, we're anticipating a little bit more in kindergarten this year because families who might have held their child out uh, due to COVID. So from a revenue standpoint, we do have uh, a smaller amount, a lesser amount than what we had in our FY21 uh, amended budget. So when you look at the revenue side, these are a couple of the items that we want to just uh, make you aware of. I did mention the fewer students decreased enrollment, about 250 students. We still have austerity cuts related to COVID. If you remember, uh, we were going to have about um, what was 14%, then that turned into 10%. And then midterm, they gave us 60% of our austerity back. So we're still showing an amount of austerity in that previous slide, I believe, Ms. Beth, was over a million dollars. Uh, yes, $1.7 million uh, related to austerity. We are hopeful that as the year uh, progresses and as the revenue continues to look as good as it does across the state, that our midterm adjustment from the state uh, when we go into legislative session next year uh, will allow some of that money to come back. Uh, so, but right now we are budgeting that, that loss with austerity. We also saw that uh, from a property tax standpoint, the reassessed growth actually outpaced the real growth. In the last couple of years, we had more real growth than reassessed growth, and that does impact the millage rate and the rollback somewhat. And so I'll share a little bit more about the millage rate in a moment. We will be utilizing some of our CARES uh, and ESSER funds, ARP funds. Uh, there have been three different rounds of that. We will be using some of those uh, to offset substitute teaching uh, substitute teachers, the PPE, but also some operational costs. We have a plan for other items that we will bring and share with you in the future. Uh, but as of right now, those are the three big things that we will be using these funds to offset in our budget. From an expenditure standpoint, when you have decreased enrollment, that also means you, you don't need as many teachers as you had last year. You don't need as many positions as you had last year. And so we are able to reduce uh, the total number of positions in our budget by 17 while still being able to maintain a, uh, a, co a comparable uh, student to teacher ratio uh, when it comes to that. We are including in those 17 uh, decreased uh, positions, three district office positions, three retirements um, that we did not have to replace. So we're more lean uh, here at the board office. Uh, we also feel like that if we're asking our schools to cut back in some positions it's not fair to ask them to cut back and we not cut back. So that, that is uh, a huge expenditure savings there. We did increase the budget playbook. It is a calculation we use every year to give our schools a certain amount of money uh, based on their enrollment, based on their uh, program involvement in different areas, but also it's based on their English learners and special education students. We did increase the calculations for the schools this year in special education and in English learners, we doubled that amount. The schools have received in the past uh, to give them more funds to be able to serve um, our EL and our SPED students. Although we have reduced revenue, we will continue to provide step increases 
That means if somebody's going from five years of experience to six years, they get a step increase and a raise. If somebody's going from a master's degree to a specialist degree, they get that increase as well. So all of that is budgeted, all of that will remain. We are adjusting the classified salary scales um, in, in almost every area. So we are looking really more than anything, increasing the base pay at the starting level for our paraprofessionals, for our clerical staff, for our secretaries, uh, for our administrative assistants and so forth. We're kind of adjusting that to make it a little more competitive uh, as, we, as we budget and hire those positions. And through some of those absorptions overall that I mentioned across the district, we are starting to bring on some positions related to uh, GMS West Campus uh, this, this, this first year. The first one, of course, is Mr. Mayor, who you just approved. Uh, but we also, once he comes on board in July, we will begin uh, the process for interviewing for a fourth counselor so that when the school opens, we can split them two and two. We'll be hiring a second graduation coach so we can split the following year. Uh, but also we will be hiring uh, one other position as well that's in there, a parent liaison uh, that will be able to be at the school. So think of it as kind of front loading some of the personnel at that school where if we waited until the school opened to hire all those people, you're now asking a lot of people to learn a lot at the same time. This way we're able to get kind of a core group together that can be in the middle school working with uh, Ms. Freeman and her team uh, as we uh, start to support our kids for that transition a year from now. So those are just some of the revenue expenditure notes that we have. When you look at our revenue as a whole and you saw it go down, that means we do have to make adjustments on an expenditure side. And so we were down in revenues, which also means we have made the cuts on the expenditure side as well to the tune of almost $2 million, which to me is phenomenal. The fact that we're able to adjust our salary scales, able to hire for the new middle school, uh, we're able to, to do all a lot of great things and keep things in our budget, like our aspiring teachers program, like our bus driver incentive programs. Nothing like that has been cut at all, uh, but we have been able to absorb positions, uh, which has allowed us then to save on some of our expenditures. So from a revenue standpoint, from an expenditure standpoint, uh, we will be bringing forward to you tonight a budget that does have decreased revenue, it does have decreased uh, expenditures. Uh, so how do we get there from a revenue? Uh, our current rate of our millage rate is 6.614 mills, which you can see in this middle column. If we were to keep that uh, millage rate the same, you will see the revenues that would be brought in would actually be adding money to our reserve. So that's why we felt comfortable as a school system. Let's look at that rollback rate and what that rollback, rollback rate looks like. The rollback rate means we take all of the digest growth and we apply formulas to it that say, if we do a rollback rate, that means that number one, the taxpayers will save money uh, in, in their uh, bill, but also it means we won't have to have the hearings that we typically have uh, when we keep the same millage rate. So if you adopt uh, the rollback rate of 6.395 mills, you will see they'll leave us with a slight deficit in the school year of about a half million dollars, which would still leave us with a fund balance at the end of FY22 of around $20 million. So the savings to the taxpayer for every $100,000 uh, that you are assessed is a savings of $21.90. So the budget I bring for you tonight uh, was a lot to digest. Uh, we will have uh, two hearings uh, that I'll share in just a moment. But you can see our revenue is down overall but our expenditures are also down. And our recommendation from a tentative standpoint will be uh, to bring this budget forward as well as the millage rate. You will, you will notice that in your packet, uh, there are a couple of dates that would be set based on this. One will be next Monday at 6 p.m. Uh, where we would have our first budget hearing. The second one will be on June 21st at 5 p.m. which would be our second budget hearing. Both would take place here at the board office we would go over this uh, presentation again and uh, take any questions that would be presented to us uh, that evening. You have a packet board that is uh, provided as well as an attachment. Uh, this will run. Uh, this is this is what we're required to share, I believe, uh, Ms. Beth, on our website. It's already uh, up. It's already up on our website to the public, and it just shows where we are as a school system. You see the uh, East Floss campaign and how healthy that is. Uh, as a campaign, 
you will see uh, that is the first document where our budget is anticipated to uh, end up around this $20 million as a projected fund balance. Keep in mind, these columns represent different amounts uh, or different um, programs. The main one we are looking at, of course, is our general fund uh, that was just shared with you. You also have in this uh, packet, the five-year digest that would be published as well uh, in the newspaper. And it shows that over the last five years, this is the lowest millage rate of 6.395 over the last five years. But we also know uh, more than 15 years now, it's been the lowest uh, millage rate that we will have uh, in, in the city or the city schools. You see the amount of a 2% overall digest increase uh, compared to some of the previous year's growth. It's a very conservative uh, growth as a school system, and we are in a position to ensure that the revenues and the expenditures balance uh, as, good po as, as well as possible. You'll also notice this, this uh, sheet here is an allotment sheet that we received from the state. It just goes through the breakdown of how we earn funds from the state. Uh, and, and you can see that total number down here at the bottom. My eyesight is not great, but I believe it's around 39 million, 404. Uh, and so my eyesight is better than I anticipated it being. Or I've seen that number enough that, that I know. 39, 404, 100. Um, so th that, that is in there that we earned from the state. And then just some of the other documents that Ms. Pethel includes uh, in her report. Hold on one second. Let's get in there to you as a board, but also to the public, just showing you the growth that we have from a budgetary standpoint, from the schools, from the department, salaries and benefits and the, the savings that are there, but also how we're using some of these funds. We are gonna use $800,000 of the CARES and ARP funds to offset the budget. Last year, uh, we actually had budgeted a million dollars to go into, or budgeted a million to go into our general fund, but we did not uh, use that. In the amended budget, we pulled it out. That's why you see a difference of that 1.8, which is how we're able to uh, make the, the budget balance within a half million dollars. Uh, also, you see other information there regarding the salaries and some of the savings, the cost uh, for some of the new positions, and then some of the absorbed positions uh, that are there in our bond debt service uh, schedule that is presented. So publicly, all of this information is available. Uh, on our assembly webpage, both the presentation is public here, as well as the uh, documents you just saw. So, Mr. Chair, I'd like to uh, recommend a tentative budget. We'll do the middle grade in just a moment, but a tentative budget based on the uh, items just shared. Motion to adopt. Got a motion by Mr. Smith. Second. <laughs> Dr. Randy, any questions? A few little comments, Mr. Chairman. This is good work, and we thank you for that. Uh, this is good for our scholars and good for our employees and very good for our taxpaying citizens. Thank you. You know, we originally uh, were going to bring this to you earlier in May, but we wanted to put pen to paper and sharpen this as much as we could. And so we feel good about being able to present a budget uh, that is going to be able to hopefully use a, a rollback millage rate uh, and just show our community that we're trying to be as conservative as possible while using some of the federal funds to serve our kids. And I believe, let me get you to repeat, I believe you said it's the lowest uh, city school village rate in 15 years. At least, it's the lowest we can find as far as the documents we have available to us. Maybe 20. Thank you for all who put this together. Uh, any more questions or comments? Got a motion by Mr. Smith, second by Dr. Ramsey. All those in favor? Motion carries. All right. The adoption of the millage rate. Yeah, we do this in uh, two separate motions. We we do have motion two to adopt. Got it. Got a motion <laughs> by Mr. Smith, second by Mr. Mitchell. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. Any discussion items? Uh, yes, Dr. Williams. One thing I wanted to ask, and I think. Uh, talk to you about this in the past, just sort of generally, but I'm, I'm interested after this year of COVID and some virtual learning and a lot of in-class learning is uh, the impact of attendance on student performance and, and really specifically at the high school level. Um, obviously, you know, you, you would imagine that 
being in class and coming to school is, is going to benefit you in your performance. But um, I just wanted to see at some point if we could get with the folks at the high school to look at how that how that has impacted kids over the last year or two. Yeah, we'll, we'll be glad to um, bring you a report of this year. I, I will tell you that we noticed with COVID, a number of our students, when we shut down in March a year ago, went out and found jobs. In many cases, they had to, to supplement what was happening in the home. We know of cases where uh, some students may have picked up a shift from a family member. Well, all of a sudden, when then that work continues throughout the summer and you're asked to come back to school, sometimes priorities have changed uh, for some of our kids. And so uh, we'll be glad to bring that to you because we did notice a significant difference this year. Uh, we'll be able to pull out what happened related to quarantines and isolations due to COVID and keep that separate versus our, our typical attendance. So yeah, we'll be glad to bring that to you over the next couple of months. Thank you. Any other discussion on this? Uh, for your question, I'll be out next Monday. I won't be at the meeting. I have a conflict with somebody next to make some motion. <laughs> I don't know. I don't well, know. I'm going to get you to give us a report. Yeah. Dr. Ramsey got a lot of practice. So I think she's going to get you to do your own. All right. Motion to adjourn to executive session. We have a motion by Mr. Smith. Second by Mr. Mitchell. All those in favor? Excuse. Thanks, everyone. Next Monday.